Somebody asked the question, you know, what is a long hunter? And long hunters were the guys that were unhappy and discontent with their hunting life along the East Coast, like the Daniel Boones and the Davy Crockett's. What they did on foot and later on horseback, that's what we did with airplanes. is very, very unique. It was very, very wild. It was very frontier. The people that were here were quite ruggedized. Well, I was born in Alaska. My, my parents were, we lived in the bush. We, we didn't have houses. We lived in um, little tents or under trees or wickiups. We did have a house when I was born of sorts. It had look, looked more like a corn crib, but some of my family were born even under trees and in, under bushes and stuff, wherever my mother happened to be. She had 17 pregnancies and eight of us lived. We lived in the winters, the summers, everything in the mountains, in the snow. We ran dog teams for our transportation. The rivers were our highways. There are several different animals that, are, that can be dangerous, you know, and uh, Starting with wolverine, you had lynx, and you had wolves, and the top of the food chain were the brown bears. I remember my mother came back after a visit before we actually moved, and they described this guy that was walking around this town where he'd gotten himself in a bear mauling, and he wasn't the only one, and she described his physical countenance, and it was quite startling. We had uh, been on a three-day hunting trip on top of a mountain way outside of our community. We were walking down a hill, walked past a patch of brush, and out came a bear, which immediately was on top of me and completely ravaged me. I mean, just split second from having the best time of your life to fighting for your life. She went right to my leg and grabbed me by my thigh and picked me up off the ground and started shaking me in the air like a rag doll. I mean, just, I mean, and I'm a heavy guy. I could just feel the anger in her and it is intense. And she bit my butt cheek and I could feel her teeth go through my butt cheek. So she actually bit through my butt cheek. As the bear moved my hands away from my head and bit down onto my skull, and started pulling my head back with its paws on my shoulder. I kind of figured that this was gonna be the way I went out, you know. Luckily, you know, my friend was able to shoot her and she dropped my head, you know. I mean, I, I mean, right at the right time, my friend saved my life. So you're going from a 12-year-old kid from, from Oregon, right? And all of a sudden you're thrown into an environment that's very adult. We saw people die from the elements in Alaska, or plane crashes, or boat sinking, guys drowned that were fishing. Wintertime, traveling through the mountains, uh, a storm can blow in like the skies are today, <clears throat> and it can be pretty white. And you can't tell if you're going up, down, sideways. You just don't know where you're at. And the best thing to do is is hunkered down. I had to camp out for a night due to the weather and the storm. It's, it's better just to, to hunker down and wait the storm out. Well, this storm lasted for, for at least 14 hours before I could even see where I was going, and I had to make a snow cave. And, and my nephew got hypothermia, and his friend got hypothermia right up here. They were up, went up the mountain, they came back, it was snowing, and his friend got really bad, so they took their packs off and he put a sleep, the one in the sleeping bag, his friend, and then he tried to hike out to get help. They went back in, but his friend had died. It was a beautiful day, they were hiking out there, and the next thing you know, you know, he lost his best friend. Kids we knew slipped off mountains and died, you know, in our class. 
And it kind of culminated with, uh, you know, September 5th, 1970. Airline slams into the Chilkoot Mountains. And me and my brother and sister were on a flight right directly behind that flight that same day, within an hour. And we get to the airport and there's frantic people running around. Uh, where's the aircraft? You know, fully loaded uh, stretch 727, 111 people on board. They're not there anymore. Okay, we land uh, and there's frantic parents, uh, family, friends waiting, and they're gone. And uh, Mick and I go to high school and we're in class and uh, first day of school, right? Well, a lot of kids from areas came in to first day of school to come into Juneau and they were killed in that crash, right? And so our teacher's calling out the names on the roster, right? Oh, they get to this name, you know, and it's like, oh yeah, this is brilliant. You know, you're, you're doing a roster check right after a disaster in a small school, right? Uh, a friend of mine later, as a commercial pilot, he was in an involved in Iraq uh, as, a, as a pilot in command for a commercial operator where a husband, a wife, and a baby died. This guy kind of solidified my whole life philosophy. How can I explain that to myself and say that there's, there's a God that would allow a baby to die uh, riding in an aircraft, you know, piloted by a guy I know? It was very perplexing to me, but I decided in my heart that day that there was no God. Being born in Alaska and um, my earliest memories, um, you know, my dad hunted and fished and uh, his job as a, a state forester, uh, he took me out, you know, I was out in boats by the time I was five and he took me hunting with him everywhere he went. Early on, uh, when my, uh, my first hunting trip, my dad stuck me up in a tree uh, because they had shot a bear and there was another bear around and it got dark and we had a moose kill and uh, they were trying to um, get the other bear and he stuck me high up in the tree and he said, whatever you do, don't you dare come down this tree till I come to get you. And so I stayed in that tree and I heard bears growling, I heard bears wailing, I heard men screaming, I heard shots and then nothing. And hours went by and it's dark and I thought my dad was dead, and I heard rustling down below the tree, and then it would disappear. Finally, my dad came to get me. He said, okay, it's safe to come down now. And he couldn't get me down from the tree. Kind of took that with me. We've had horses and dogs, and we've had both wolves and bears eat our horses and dogs. We've had a real, we had to put bells on the horses to keep the, the wolves and the bears away because the bear didn't like the sound of the bells. So, the bell was good for two reasons. We could find the horses if we listened, and also it kept the bears and wolves from eating them. So, although they did eat part of them, but, <laughs> but, but you know, is this the uh, bears are, have been really a plague. Yeah, they were something that always fascinated me was, was the grizzly bears and, uh, and even the black bears for that matter. Spent some time up on the ice, polar bear and, and uh, I guess I've killed three that I, if I hadn't shot them, they'd have got me. When I arrived in Juneau, it was only accessible by air or sea. I got into big game hunting pretty quickly. I got into trapping and found soon that there's an immense amount of territory around us here. And in 10 lifetimes, you'd never get a chance to see it all. You can get on a plane and see all kind of wonderful things. And there's, the mountains are uh, just spectacular. And there's usually snow on most of them. It's, it's just an absolutely beautiful place. You cannot imagine until you see it what a beautiful place it is. It's just breathtaking. Fishing's good, the flying's good, the hunting's good, y'all. And hey, Probably 99 out of 100 people that walk through my door I like. 
biggest mountain in North America is in my backyard. You know, what do you want? The weather is just, it's like little microclimates. And you can be like right on a mountain peak and look over to another one that's totally, you know, blacked out. And then five minutes later, your mountain be blacked out and that one will be beautiful and sunny. The day I got in trouble with the hail, hey, it started out, it was a blue sky, beautiful day. And I had a bunch of people out on a lake fishing and I'm packing them back and uh, last guy. You know, and man, it went from beautiful blue sky to, hey, you couldn't see half a mile, maybe, but I'd been up and down the valley a thousand times. I felt I, you know, I could find my way, not very far, 20 miles, you know. I can get back. Well, I ran into the hail and I didn't get back, you know. And, Put a lot of holes in a little rag airplane and doesn't fly anymore. My father was killed in a mid-air. I had cousins that were killed when they hit trees in bad weather. I counted up one time, and I don't remember how many friends I've lost in airplanes, but it's approaching 50. In every month of the year here, every month of the year, it has, I've seen snow last year, in fact, it snowed every single month, at least once. Hey, if you don't like it, the weather, hey, wait five minutes, it'll probably, be, might be worse, but it'll probably be different. I acquired a couple of friends in high school. I remember one was Pat Millard. So when Pat and I were trapping and hunting one time, we saw a band of mountain goats, and we decided we should try to take them. And I took a shot, and I saw a mountain goat fall, and I took that shot, and we had a code. You know, if you shoot it, you pack it out. And I really did not like where that mountain goat fell. There was no extracting that mountain goat from where I could see, but we were gonna go try. So we got up in there and there was one little ledge that led around the corner to where I could maybe get a, a, a view of where that mountain goat fell, all right? And I got on that ledge and I hiked out there thinking, you know, I can do this, right? And the ledge kind of steepened, and I stopped and said, what the heck am I doing here? I need to backtrack out. And I couldn't hardly backtrack. And I thought, holy cow, I am one stuck turkey. And I called for my friend, Pat, who was above me, but he was like 15 feet, 20 feet above me. And he tried to drop his gun, trying to use it as a rope. And so I just spread out, trying to hold on to the hillside and I felt myself go. And I was in the air, and it was hundreds of feet straight down. There was no ending but death. And at that time, I, I watched my life kind of pass before me like a, like a movie, right? And so I woke up, and there was a ledge about five feet above me where I had slipped from, so my feet we're down here, and the ledge was like five feet above my head, totally un impossible for a human to get to uh, naturally. And I was standing on that ledge about six feet below Pat. And he looked at me, and he said, how did you do that? I said, I don't know, but let's get the heck out of here. My philosophy had always been that there is no deity. There is no outside higher power. I had not petitioned any deity. I didn't have time, nor did I even think remotely that there was anything that was gonna help me. I was just like floating. So that was an experience, but you know what? When you got back to school, you really didn't have a problem with self-esteem when you went through an experience like that. Uh, you really didn't need to see a counselor about what you were meant to do in life. Uh, you didn't really feel like you needed uh, a lot of help, outside help to accomplish things. In school, there was very select few people that I met that uh, had similar interests as me. One of the persons in particular that I met uh, was uh, Mark Rose. He was very like-minded as far as being an adventurous spirit. We would take our Christmas vacation plus a couple of days on each end and go out to a remote location somewhere in Alaska and trap and hunt deer at the same time. Uh, we were out deer hunting in the islands and uh, over Christmas break and um, we had Mark's boat 
Yeah, not exactly the kind of boat to be out in and that kind of stuff, but uh, you know, so we're out there trying to navigate island to island in the winter and uh, uh, we were trying to get back home because we'd already been out hunting and uh, we'd already been weathered in for three, four days and we were getting tired of it. And we were kind of, you know, the wind was blowing, there was white caps and heavy freezing spray. Every three minutes we had to spell each other on the motor and take over because our, our faces were getting white frostbitten. And uh, the other, we had to relieve the driver and uh, so they could cover their face. We knew the bears were there. We knew they knew we were there. So we just did our best to avoid them uh, and not, you know, engage with the bears and uh, try to have a kind of a, a coexistence, uh, even though um, it was tenuous at times. We were charged twice, point blank, by a bear. Mick! And that uh, uh, was, uh, matter of fact, we spent the night uh, sleeping in the tent. Well, I don't, wouldn't call it sleeping. We were laying there in the tent uh, with our safeties on, um, waiting for another event to happen. Uh, I remember sleeping in my sleeping bag, actually having half a night's sleep once out of probably uh, three or 400 times camping, thinking about the bears. And so we slept with our rifles. The difference between me and some of my other friends in the end was is I moved into aviation. Flying a general is safety-wise probably about the same as motorcycles. It's a dangerous occupation. I tell people when they, they approach me and tell me that they want to learn how to fly, I, I tell them you really, really, really need to want to learn how to fly because if you dabble in it, you are, are going to hurt yourself and probably somebody else. One of the things they had in high school, they had a program where you went through pilot training and they paid for a few flight hours for all the students that applied to the class and that was cool. I got to fly with a woman pilot, her name is Gail Rainey. She became a great Alaska woman bush pilot. Mark was uh, so excited about uh, the flying. I mean, he d it was in his blood, you could tell. And um, just eager as could be, he wanted to get out on those beaches just as quickly as he could. That was his goal right away, right from the start. He wanted to be able to fly the beaches and see everything from that wonderful, glorious uh, view that you get. I bought this airplane. It's uh, short, short takeoff capable. They call them a stall, short takeoff or landing aircraft, called them mall. So I became kind of learned in how to land very, very short, <laughs> you know, then got to use it in my work. And I would take like a month, six weeks off every year to hunt with it. We got to the point where, we're, you know, I had to go set out fuel stashes. A lot of guys up here short themselves on gas because they're flying heavy out of short strips. But if, if you're gonna do that, you should stash some gas somewhere and along the route. So if you have to, you can, you can stop and dump five more gallons in. And we flew out to the edge of airplane range for its fuel capability, and we landed. We unloaded these tins of fuel, and sometimes we'd make a couple of trips like that to build up fuel enough to be able to range out again. It, it extended our radius and our, our round trip range into new hunting areas that we wanted to see. You want to, to try to make sure that you mitigate all the bad things that can happen to you before you ever hit the starter, starter button. That threw us into a whole different world and expanded our horizons uh, uh, exponentially of where we could go, what we could see, because we couldn't get enough of Alaska. Bottom line, we couldn't get enough of it. We love seeing the big game. I'm up in college in Fairbanks, and uh, Mark was up there uh, finishing up his uh, A&P. And we continued to go out trapping up there, and we, he had his plane, and we'd go on day trips in his plane. And as Mick uh, and I developed our relationship, 
Uh, then we melded the two together, and I became kind of the, the pilot of the pair. And Mick, with his outstanding experience and survival capabilities and keeping us aware, keeping us very well equipped, keeping us second head in the game, you know, we, we kind of teamed up, made a great partnership. Mark had been after me to take some time off of school and, uh, you know, start doing some real trips with him. And by that time, you know, he'd done a lot of helicopter duty up in uh, uh, the Brooks Range, you know, during the pipeline days. And he'd done some flying up there in his own plane and he had some great ideas for, for some hunting trips. And, um, you know, I had a friend from uh, uh, the Kobuk River Valley there, uh, Anupak Eskimo, and he was always telling us about the gobs of caribou up there and you could get caribou easy. We heard all the stories, wanted to try this out, got all ready, loaded the aircraft up, got out our maps, figured out the fuel ranges to get there, where we would refuel to get out there. And I remember took it, taking off, turning to the north and looking at the country uh, into a wide and spacious, huge, massive valley uh, in the quest to find a herd of caribou. a good hour and a half or so, and uh, we flew, broke out into this uh, plateau, uh, a large opening in between the, uh, the Brooks Range Mountains there. And uh, we're flying along, and we're just about getting ready to turn back. And it, what we saw was thousands of caribou going through the pass. You read about the stories of the buffalo, and so there's uh, the, the only way to describe it, when you see the actually, the land is actually moving with all these animals. You're thinking, gee whiz, this isn't cattle, this isn't sheep, this is big game. This is wild country. These animals are moving, they've lived here for a thousand years, and we're getting to experience it. And, you know, we're just looking at each other, and oh, holy cow, what did we stumble on here? As far as the eye could see, there's caribou, and Mark and I are all boisterous and everything, you know, oh, this is gonna be a great hunt. Look at all these animals, you know, the plane's going like this. Uh, Mark said, oh yeah, I guess I, I, I better get back to my flying, you know. And there we were, you know, with the right equipment and at the right time, at the right place. And uh, figured out a place to land. I, I set Mick down, but we knew we were kind of pushing the limits with fuel and time and nighttime coming on and I had another hunter to move up, dropped Mick off, minimum amount of gear, said goodbye, popped off and dove down the valley. We knew we were pushing the boundaries, you know, like probably uh, we should have just all gone back to the camp. But at any rate, um, you know, why waste a day? And uh, we kind of figured it was gonna be twilight by the time he got back. And I also remember Mark saying his gas supply was gonna be an issue, you know. So I'm taking all this in. Running out of gas is not something you want to do in an airplane. And uh, running out of fuels, almost making the airport isn't good enough. And at that time, uh, I had looked up and I had what we call a low side generator failure. My generator stopped. And all kinds of things kind of come into mind when that happens. And your radios are running totally on your battery. And then the battery fails, you can lose a lot of instruments and you'll be in the hand prop mode, which is very, very dangerous unless you're, uh, uh, you know how to do it safely. I had my 300 Winchester Magnum with me. I have my knife, a few things, you know, a tent, a um, few crackers, candy bars, and uh, we're good to go. It was starting to get dark a little bit, twilight. Um, I finally heard a plane coming. There's Mark coming back. And uh, unfortunately at that time, the caribou decided to start their migration again, and they were all Get over out. the sandbar. And I tried running at them, uh, running around, screaming. They wouldn't move. And meantime, Mark's circling and circling, and lights disappearing. Finally, uh, I think uh, Mark got the idea, and he made a few low passes over the caribou, and that kind of helped a little bit. At the last second, they opened up a little gap, and I said, oh, shit, I, th I think I'm lined up okay, let me go for it. 
All I want to do is get Mark on the ground safely and get on with the show. And Mick and I had made a prearranged concept of how he was going to mark where I was going to land. And what happened was, is the wind switched. So I had to land in the opposite direction, which put Mick and the pylon marker on the other side of the aircraft. So I'd worked out with this passenger, hey, when I get to that pylon that he's made, this man-made thing on that sandbar, you tell me I'll chop the power because I know I've got enough sandbar left to land on. And I said, if we land long, it's really bad news. There's terrible boulders down there. We're going to tear up the aircraft. So, okay, okay. So I get all set up. I made a pass. I get all set up, you know, but I can't see exactly where Mick is. And this other guy is supposed to call it off where he is, and I'm supposed to chop power and be, you know, the miracle bush pilot, right? Uh, big shot of the day. So I get in there, and we're coming in. I'm set up really nice, and uh, um, Mick's blind to me. And uh, I'm set up, getting ready to chop power, and I see Mick go by. And just as he passed me, he drops down. I shot in for a landing. It was a, kind of a stupid mistake. I was breaking some rules. I was breaking some personal limits. And all I saw was a loud, horrible, crunching, screaming noise. Sparks were flying from the plane. Rocks were flying. I dove on the ground because I'm pretty close to the action there. So I threw in all the power I've got, stagger back into the air, and said, holy cow, what I, what I do? I can feel there's some damage somewhere in the aircraft. I didn't know exactly what, but I darn sure wasn't going to like go back in there and land again. Yeah, he's circling the sandbar. And you could tell that he was you know, checking out his controls and trying to decide what to do. This passenger uh, kind of fought over the fact that he didn't want me to kick out our Arctic suit uh, for Mick. We already left him a tent and stuff like that. And I said, no, 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 he's got to have this suit. He's going to get stuck here. Very possibly, if this weather is going to deteriorate. And it's getting darker. It's almost dark now. And all of a sudden, he wags his wing and off he goes, flying. The last I saw was that plane heading into a snowbank. You can see there, I kind of broke some rules as a low time pilot. I had a few things gang up on me though. I, I was given a good weather report that fell apart all around me. Uh, the caribou were a factor that we didn't know was coming on. Uh, the fact that the pylon uh, idea completely failed us because uh, I had to land on the other way. And, uh, and uh, you know, the whole thing of being light on fuel uh, and then the generator failure. Lots of things can happen that you're not prepared for. So even with the best intent and following the laws and all the stories, you get yourself caught once in a while. I thought the plane was really damaged. I knew he was low on fuel. And I was wondering if I was even going to see him again. And I, I, I know it's about a good 200 miles back to uh, yeah, which would be the only lighted strip. Uh, I didn't really know what he was doing, you know. Um, but I figured that's what he was, where he was headed. Dashed out toward my fuel stash to discover a white wall of weather. I have it written on my panel. If you can't see through it, don't do it. And in doubt, don't. There was no way I could make my fuel stash. There was no way I could make it to any other landing zone. The village that, that was a uh, you know 60, 80 miles down there was completely socked in. The weather was deteriorating. It was snowing hard in the air, and I was becoming. I was getting into a place where I was using up all my fuel and all my outs. So I went back, set up the tent right by the riverbank, because, uh, you know, I'm from southeast, and, uh, you know, you, you want to set your tent, at least I'd learn where I've got it out, you know. Uh, I'm thinking bears. Bears are on my mind all the time. you got to watch your, your back, you know. So I wanted the river to protect my back, and I'm by myself, and I don't know how long I'm going to be by myself. I have my 300 Winchester rifle, and I grab my ammo pack. It's not my ammo pack. It's Mark's ammo pack for his 243. I have three bullets in my rifle. Normally, I carry a bunch in my coat. I don't know how that didn't happen. So now I'm stuck out there 200 miles up the Brooks Range by myself with three bullets. 
I'm running into all these uh, uh, aviation challenges that are very, very particular to flying in Alaska, right? And so, but I have a passenger with me that is from down south, has only been in Alaska a couple of years, never done anything even remotely close to this in his life. He's not an idiot. He sees the fuel gauges going down, right? And he sees them stop, the needles stop moving. And we still got a lot more flying and we got fuel. And we are in what we often refer to as a flying coffin. And we are running out of, we also refer to as power runway and ideas uh, before the crash, you know? And all of a sudden he starts to panic. And he even says, you know, we're gonna die, aren't we? Um, you know, I mean, it was a little bit of a traumatic event and uh, you're thinking about it, so I'm all keyed up. And uh, I put on the, uh, uh, Arctic survival suit that Mark had kicked out of his plane for me before he took off into the snowstorm there. And uh, I put it on, and uh, the caribou kept coming, kept coming. And I didn't want to be inside the tent because I wanted to be able to see. You know, I'd had that bad tent experience in Southeast with Mark when we were trapping where we had Bear come up to the tent more than once. And uh, if I'm going to have to fight it out, I want to be outside the tent. You know, but at any rate, uh, probably one of the coolest experiences I've had in the wilderness in my entire life was what happened next. And that is uh, the entire Arctic Western caribou herd, as it's migrating, decided to migrate right around my tent. I could reach out and touch them, and there was thousands of them and they made a, a swarm right around the tent like I was nothing. And I, I stood out there cross-legged in front of the tent, and I could practically reach out and grab caribou, and I was like nothing. And they did that all night long. Hundreds of them, thousands of them passed that, and they'd go into the river right behind my tent. And it was the coolest thing I've ever experienced in my life, I have to say. What are my options? I have no options. Both tanks were on E, the weather was worse. I was in the mountains at night, trapped in the sky. And the chances of surviving that is nil. I had seen that happen to other pilots and they had never survived. And I thought, oh, I was gonna be another statistic here tonight. I had never thought of this before, but I thought, well, I, I'm in enough jam here. If there's a God, I could use help right now. <laughs> and, and I just spoke those words to myself and I just said, you know, if there's a God, I need your help now. And at that time, a voice spoke in my mind and I saw a light in my mind. And it said, son, you said the right thing. And uh, I hesitated for a moment. What was that? You know, I had never talked to God before. I wasn't a religious guy, and I was an anti-religious guy. I was an atheist guy. With that, I thought, well, that was nice, but how's that gonna help me here at 3,000 feet, uh, getting ready to die from fuel starvation? So I didn't sleep that night. Um, I'm really worried about Mark, and uh, I'm thinking, will I ever see him again? Still comes back. You know, you've, you've done all these travels. You've had near life uh, and death experiences with this guy. You've, you've had eight, 10 years of camaraderie and travel and, and uh, uh, you know, backing each other up. And, and uh, uh, here, I might never see him again. And the engine started to pack up. I was running out of fuel. And about that time, we broke out. And there on the horizon was the lights of Kotzebue. And I could see it, I was like 15 miles out. I couldn't believe it. I had stayed on course, you know, I'd maintained altitude, I'd, I was managing the dead battery, right, that was running my navigation, that I, I had not enough battery to run any other lights. I had my flashlight out like the FAA says you should have to look at the map. I was locked on with my navigation equipment on the Kotzebue, and there she appeared, thank God. 
And the only problem was I knew I had one more element to overcome. The 12 miles of 35 degree salt water to cross on no gas. And I'll tell you, 12 miles may not seem like much, but that's about seven or eight minutes of you thinking about life because your life is in, is hanging by a thread of that engine keeping turning until you get within gliding range of that airstrip at Kotzebue. I kind of figured, you know, if, if Mark goes down uh, on the way back to Kachibu, um, who's going to know I'm here, you know? So I figured if Mark made it, they'd send a plane for me the next day. All that next day came and went, no plane. That ain't good. Maybe he didn't make it. Or hopefully if he went down, he's OK. Day two, no plane. Okay, not good. Yeah, and the caribou are starting to like thin out now. So I'm thinking, well, maybe I better shoot one. I might need something uh, to eat, but I don't want to waste one of my shells, you know? So I'm thinking, you know, they're coming right by the tent. I wonder if I could stab one. So I get a good stout pole and I take my uh, K-Bar uh, army knife and I had some string and I made a spear out of it. And I'm thinking, you know, if I, even if I do run out of bullets, then at least I've got this weapon. I've got something. I couldn't get myself to spear one of them caribou because I didn't want to wound it and have it take off. So later I shot one. Day three, came and went. Now I'm thinking pretty seriously, maybe he did go down. This ain't, <clears throat> this all going through my mind, you know? And now I'm thinking, oh, maybe I'm gonna have to build a raft, float down the no attack, you know? Um, day four comes, okay, late in the day, I hear an airplane, it's circling, no, it's gonna land, it's not marked. This plane lands way down there in the sandbar, I walk all the way up to the plane, and there's uh, the flight service guys in there, the guy that we met at flight service, who is a fairly uh, famous Alaska bush pilot, by the way, and I didn't know at the time. And uh, he goes, hey, what do you have? He had a look on his face, like nothing. He goes, oh, he doesn't want to tell me Mark's dead, you know? And uh, I don't know how he found me, but uh, then he breaks into a smile and he goes, hey, your buddy's uh, fixing up his plane and he's going to be back up here uh, maybe today, maybe tomorrow. How you doing? Are you okay? And I was like, he's alive, he made it. So that's good. And I made it across Kotzebue Sound with a running engine and landed. I was a very relieved and very uh, thankful guy. I wasn't sure who I should be thankful to. Uh, something had definitely audibly spoke to me. I didn't make that up. So we regrouped. I ordered parts for the aircraft, got them. Just before dark, again, I hear this plane coming. There it is. So he circled the, the uh, sandbar a few times, and he's wagging his wings, and I'm doing all this stuff. And then uh, he comes down, he lands. And I was never so happy to see that guy. Uh, you know, we were both learning lessons, but I was very, very, very happy to see him in one piece, and he was quite happy, I think, to see me in one piece. I have always said that his mother probably would have killed me if uh, she had met me back at the airport Kotzebue after leaving him there. But uh, all's well that ends well. Another page written in pilot education. 
You know, you have to remember, I got to thinking, we're barely 20 years old, and here's two friends way up here, more than a thousand miles away from home, doing our own thing out 200 miles in the wilderness, real wilderness, not lower 48 wilderness. I mean, you are absolutely on your own, and this is the kind of stuff we live for. This is wonderful. Now let's get on with the hunt. So six months later, I'm working my day job, which was taking care of a fleet of helicopters. And pretty soon, somebody walked up and said, guess what, you know, your helicopter just crashed. Seeing how the aircraft was wrecked with a 55-gallon drum sitting in my seat, which means if I would have ridden, which I normally did, I rode shotgun on those slings, you know, I could be just as dead as a doornail right now. I just got spared again. A day later, I was to be extracted out of the camp. I was sitting in the Twin Otter, flying home, and just going, you know, I've not been listening at all. I'm just not getting it. And I think it's time that I really need to get it. It changed my life. So after collecting all this information and this experience, getting back to town, bringing the guys out of the mountains, uh, I had to deal with some interesting issues. My philosophy had always been that there is no deity. There is no outside higher power. And it was clear to me something had noticed my predicament and responded to my petition. And in the case of me slipping off the cliff, I had not petitioned any deity. I didn't have time, nor did I even think remotely that there was anything that's gonna help me. I was just like floating at that time. So this made me face a couple of issues in my life because I had been like an atheist. I had not seen the work of any deity. I had said in my heart, there is no God. How could a baby die in the cockpit with a friend of mine that was a great pilot and his parents and there'd be a God? And uh, on the heels of September 5th, 1970. So. And, and wrestling with this issue, I said, okay, if there's a God, I'm gonna to try to find the right one, okay? So uh, kind of, I started thinking about people in my life that I really admired and that had faith. And I thought, well, I'm a little more intellectual and a little more scientific and smarter than they are. Uh, and I've just kind of tolerated their faith. But now this other incident just doesn't make any sense. What spoke to me? Uh, who put the extra gas in my tanks? And why am I here today after slipping off that mountain those years before? I'll take it, it's all cool, but I've got to find out who and why. And so I started thinking, like I said, about these people that had been uh, very formative in my life that I so respected and had good lives and had made marriage work, uh, had been devoted to each other, which also is a question for all of the time. There's a lot of divorce, a lot of breakups going on in that time. And uh, who they were and why did they believe in the Bible? Why did they go to church? I was like, okay, did they have this experience like I had? And so I started reading the Bible. I read the Bible end to end, but yet I was still not ready to like, okay, that's all cool. Like, 
I started seeing God in the Bible and I kind of like liked the guy. I saw he was fair, uh, he was just, he wasn't ever asking any more of anybody than he was very clear about and it all seemed very fair and okay to me and but yet people still like rejected him, disobeyed him, spit in his eye and uh, I kind of saw myself in that picture. One day uh, I remember I uh, got a call from uh, Camp Radio to come down and meet my helicopter and uh, I got down there and uh, he actually came and left without me. Out. Why did he do that? He'd never done, this pilot's never done that to me before. We were gonna go on a real cool trip. Uh, somebody drove over and said, you know what, your machine just crashed on the mountain, right above your head up there. I said, what? Yeah, but the pilot's okay. So we got another machine, went up there, landed. Uh, there was my machine upside down. You know, it was like my whole like personal world, right? My, my ego was wrapped around kind of my job. Pilot and helicopter maintenance tech, got a fleet that I'm doing work for. Kind of like my personal ego just deflated. My, my crutch had been pulled out from under me. So I got up the ship, looked in there, and my side seat was as flat as a tabletop. And there was a 55 gallon drum left where my seat was. And I thought, holy cow, if he'd have picked me up like the arrangement was, I would be there and not standing out here. Flight came in, uh, I need to be, get extracted out of the country to do some other stuff, kind of think about all this. And I remember sitting in a twin otter on the extraction flight out. Uh, thinking about all this and what I'd read in the Bible and I decided to become a Christian. I kind of crossed over and I felt myself cross over from death to life when I made that commitment. It was like this light came on and my philosophies about uh, origins and naturalistic evolution, all that kind of went, all went away. I then started going to church. I married the bookkeeper, started family. Uh, my life changed dramatically after that. It was, it was my moment in life, and I then felt comfortable to do a thing called get married and commit your life and all that, that I never felt comfortable about before. So that's kind of the wrap up of that story. I remember uh, next job was just to collect that ship off that mountain, put it on a big flatbed. It was my job to drive it out, take it out of town. And it was like, yeah, there's my big ego trip, you know, all smashed up into little pieces sitting there behind me. Uh, and so I was a different boy. And so I started reading the Bible. I read the Bible end to end, and I remember thinking about all this, I was looking at things differently. I was looking at the creation and order of the universe from the standpoint that there is a deity, that there's something more powerful, bigger than us out there. Uh, it's a deity that saw me born, allowed me to go to Alaska, saw me slipping off that cliff, came to my aid when I said my first prayer, and my whole perspective about Alaska then dramatically changed and unalterably changed. And then I thought that, you know, that, that life is really a gift and that I had been blessed out of my mind to be able to get in these beautiful aircraft and serve you know, mankind in that way and enjoy Alaska for what it really is. It's made to challenge us every front, from every mountain, to every valley, to every river, to the wild ocean surf, uh, to just challenge us as human beings in this natural wonder we call Alaska.